today on Dr. Phil. Did their son's girlfriend kill him? You believe she knew he had overdosed and didn't tell you? Yes. That's a big leap to this girl murdered this boy. Now, did you kill Chris? No. Father. Did you wait 45 minutes to get us to make sure that he was dead? Stepmom. You are lying. Tell the truth. That's You're psychotic. You need to be in a ward. And girlfriend. I fell to my knees, started screaming at the top of my lungs. Do we have to hear all this ridiculousness? I, I, it's all a lie. Face off. You take fentanyl, and he died of an overdose of that drug. I was never aware that he took any of my pain medication. How did he get the fentanyl? Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by, Dr. Phil. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. In five, four. I am not giving up on you. talking about 20 year old Chris he was a really fun loving guy he was in great shape planning on joining the Marines he was a young man with his whole life ahead of him but sadly that life would be cut short just a few weeks before his 21st birthday Chris was found dead from a drug that is 100 times more potent than heroin and on the rise in suburban areas and his parents would be pointing the finger at his girlfriend, Tony. Take a look. Prior to my son going out with Tony, I never knew him to be involved with any drugs. It was totally out of his character. He was a fitness nut. The night my son died, Christopher got sick after partying with Tony. Christopher started complaining about not feeling good, and something didn't seem right between the two of them. Around 10 o'clock, Christopher and Tony went up to their bedroom quarter after 11. Tony yelled up the steps to Sally, is Christopher up there? And Sally said, no, he's not up here. And then she said, well, maybe he went for a walk. That's when Sally went all the way down the stairs and confronted her and said, what do you mean he went for a walk? So I was like, okay, so like, where is he? She's like, well, I don't know. What if something really bad happened to him? I had a chill through my body because of the way she had said that. When I came up those stairs and banged on that door, I knew by the second bang. Something was really wrong. I ran back down, ran over. I said, Bob, you got to go right now. Something's wrong with your son. I know it. I pushed the door in hard. He was sitting on top of the toilet, chin on his hand, with his eyes barely closed. And I immediately felt the shock of seeing my son dead. Tony had waited a crucial 45 minutes before she came over to get us. Tony's the only one that could have prevented my son's death. Tony knew right where Christopher was, and she lied to us. If she had come to us sooner, he could be alive today. Whatever you were doing, you left him for 45 minutes in the state of New York. They call that murder. Well, Bob and Sally say they are convinced that Chris's girlfriend caused their son's death after she disappeared and did not even attend his funeral. Tony is continually making statements, trying to divert the blame for my son's death. While we were at the hospital, Tony did go into the bathroom and she was flushing the toilet continually. And I figured that she was probably getting rid of any kind of paraphernalia she might've had on her. But as the days went on and I started seeing the Facebook and the text messaging mentioned Adderall and marijuana and tinnies. This is the case in which I found on the outside pocket of Christopher's suitcase. And when I opened it up, I dumped out what was in it, and what was in it was a piece of tin foil. On the inside, I had found something what appeared to look like plastic, burnt and melted. Tony Ann needs to start being honest with herself. She needs to admit, okay, I was partying. It's all over the internet. Everybody sees it. You're not fooling or kidding me. I believe Tony is psychotic because there was pictures of her on Facebook at a college party and where she was drinking with a bunch of guys and she was making cheers to Christopher, how we miss you, bro. I would like to see justice because she is continually bringing this up and actually making a mockery out of my son's death. First off, obviously, I have to say I am so sorry for your loss. 
As a father of, of two boys, I just cannot even imagine. So I'm very sorry you. uh, for your loss. Your position is that his girlfriend, Tony, is responsible for his death in two ways. One, she didn't alert you, and B, got him started on drugs, right? That, that, that's exactly my position. So you believe that she knew he had overdosed and didn't tell you? Yes. Why do you all believe that? You, did you talk to her first? Um, I did, um, because after coming home, I went upstairs. Christopher was complaining about not really feeling so good, so we weren't really sure what was going on. He seemed a little distant from his dad since he had gotten there, and for me, I found it to be kind of odd. What does that have to do with her causing his death? I, I hear you talking about all that, that, you know, he was acting a little different, he was talking to this one and not that one. That's a big leap to this girl murdered this boy. The social awkwardness, which was, it was never present in uh, my son's life and myself, began to happen on this particular visit. And Tony was very much aware of it, and she was keeping, more or less, keeping my son from having any um, direct personal um, contact with myself. And this particular night, when we had returned from a restaurant, uh, Tony and Christopher went to their side of the house, just disappeared, no formal good night nothing of that sort and then w within uh, an hour or so is when Tony uh, represented herself to Sally by um, asking us where Christopher was this was late at night I was starting to fall asleep Sally was sitting up she was very perplexed about the way the whole evening went because they were while we were together in the car they were they weren't talking at all but they were texting each other in the back seat of the car and Tony did not obviously want me to hear what she was talking about. And my son was very upset. He didn't feel well because I think the, all the pressure was really, com was really um, starting to bother him with her being a, divi a dividing force between us. Okay, so one of the things you're pointing to is that your, your son was seeming to distance himself from you and Under pressure. get really involved with this girl. But that seems to kind of be the natural order of things. Now, maybe you don't like the girl or whatever, and so that you think may be a bad influence or, or whatever, and I understand that. But you, you say Tony that night was high as a kite. Oh, she appeared to be. Um, not knowing the whole full length of what was going on prior to their visit out in Wisconsin. And out in Wisconsin, they seemed to be going to a lot of parties. Bob had showed me the Facebooks and showed me pictures, and I just seemed to see all drinking. All partying. That's all I saw all over their, their internet is partying, partying, partying. They're underage children. In Wisconsin, I do believe the law is 21 to be able to drink. Um, what else they did at these parties, the depth of it, I don't know. Well, let's fast forward to the night because you're, you're talking about things that I understand that you may think there's a causal link there because of the pattern of behavior that was developing. Absolutely. Right. So, I mean, as it's not that, I, it's not that I, I don't get it, but... Right. As a parent, you see the development yeah, it, it, from it, it, childhood It's, it's a adult. pretty big leap. But let's, let's look at the timeline of, of, of what happened so we just know kind of what the sequence of events was, okay? Very good. Now, we're talking about March 16th. Chris buys foil to make a tinny to smoke marijuana, okay? Now, we, we know that. The March 18th, it's reported that he smoked marijuana to help him sleep. I have no idea. I, I wasn't aware of that. But okay, well, we're, we're, I'm giving you some information. Okay. Then on the 19th at 5.30, he, it said that he smoked marijuana to relax. And we'll be able to discuss this sure. in a little bit. 8 p.m., he complains he's tired and has a headache. At 10.43, Chris texts Tony, I'm really car sick. At 10.50 p.m., Chris goes to downstairs bathroom to throw up. At 11 p.m., Tony hears Chris go to the upstairs bathroom. And at 11.35, she asks Sally and Bob about Chris's whereabouts. Is that true? The last part is absolutely true. Okay, 11.48, uh, Chris is found unresponsive in the bathroom. Sally calls 911 and Bob starts CPR. Correct. All, correct. all correct there? Okay. Then March 20th now, 
at 12.30 a.m., the first EMS responders arrive. One o'clock, paramedics arrive and try to resuscitate Chris for an hour. Two o'clock, he's taken to the hospital. At 2.40, you're informed that he has passed. I actually went to the coroner's office in Connecticut and obtained the, um, the coroner's report. And he was pronounced at 1 o'clock at the hospital, 101. I believe he arrived at the hospital at 1 o'clock, and they pronounced him one minute after he was there. Because my son never left that house alive. When, so, when somebody in the fruit of their life um, dies unnaturally, mm -hmm. it is actually considered um, a homicide till proven otherwise in okay. most circumstances. I mean, right. it was a mistake to remove him from that house because he never showed a sign of life. Well, let me ask you a few questions because Tony, who we'll talk to, says that you refuse to let the EMS do CPR on him. It's ridiculous. I was doing rescue breathing while my friend Tommy was doing um, chest compressions. And you're a firefighter, correct? I'm retired. Uh, but, but you've trained I've as a this, firefighter. Uh, yes. So you're, you're trained in all of this. Trained and in so all this bit. wasn't just you making this up as you go along. You no. know what you were doing. It's very methodical. Bottom line, you two think but for him meeting and being in a relationship with Tony, he would be alive today. Absolutely. Okay. And you understand that she believes you killed your son. That's what I heard. She believes that you killed him out of revenge for your ex-wife. <laughs> it's oh just, my God. you know, it, it's an hysterical laughter, I'm sorry, but it is um, so absurd that, um, well, I, I think that it, 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 that is a sign of a deep sickness in a human being to even say that. Well, Bob and Sally have not seen Tony uh, since the night their son died over a year ago. 17 months. She's been watching the show backstage. They haven't seen her. She, they said she didn't come to the funeral. Well, she's here. She's going to come out, and we're going to try to get to the bottom of this. We're going to find out what she has to say after the break. I believe that Bob or Sally poisoned Chris. Bob is a deceitful, psychotic ass. I believe that Bob is capable of murder. And later. I am a mother of five children. Yeah. And I am sitting here and I can look at you face to face. You are lying. I, you are lying. Okay. Tell the story, tell the truth. My son died because he was left alone after he partied with his girlfriend who abandoned him. Tony was not crying. I saw no emotion. Tony never came to the wake. She is not innocent. She's guilty of negligence. My husband has to live without his son for this reason. Well, Bob and Sally are convinced their son's girlfriend, Tony, killed their boy. But Tony is pointing the finger right back at Bob and Sally. She says they are 100% guilty of harming their son. I believe that Bob and Sally are responsible for the death of my boyfriend, Chris. Chris died because Bob or Sally poisoned Chris. I think that Chris was killed in conspiracy so that Sally could get all of Bob's money. Bob would never have to speak or have anything to do with his ex, who is Chris's mother. Bob was trying to blame me so that no one would point the fingers at him. After Chris died, Bob just lied about everything. He told people I was stealing money and drugs. He even told people that I had gotten Chris into drugs, which is completely false. When I spoke to the detective after Chris died, they told me that he had died of acute fentanyl poisoning. Bob did not want an autopsy done on Chris because he knew that they would find Bob's fentanyl in Chris's system. If Bob gave his fentanyl to Chris and that's why he died, Bob should be responsible for murder. Bob is a deceitful, psychotic ass. I believe that Bob is capable of murder. It's been over a year since Bob and Sally have seen Tony. Well, she is here today. Someone asked her to join us for this conversation. Tony, come on out. Hi, Tony. Dr. Phil, how are you? Good. How are you? Have a seat. All right, Tony, you've been listening to the show so far, so yeah. you know the positions that have been taken here. Are you responsible for this young man's death? Absolutely not. Did you kill Chris? No. Did you know that Chris has overdosed in the bathroom, was on the floor, and, and failed to tell anyone for 45 minutes because you thought you would get in trouble? Absolutely not. I didn't even know fentanyl or any drug was involved until two months after he died. I had believed he died of a brain aneurysm. I said they took some leaps 
in saying you guys were spending too much time together and you were a wedge between them. That's a big jump from that to saying that you murdered yeah. this, this boy. But it then, uh, yeah, I read here that you say that he killed his son because he, he hated his ex-wife and wanted revenge. Why do you say that? Because after Chris died, I learned a lot about the truth. Before Chris died, he had believed so many lies about his mother that came from Bob that were completely false to make Chris completely hate her. And that alone, why would you manipulate your son to hate the, like, the most important person in his life? That doesn't make sense to me. I understand, but I'll say to you what I said to them. That, that is a quantum leap to therefore he poisoned his son to get back at the woman. Yeah. That, that's a... I, 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 I'm I don't, sorry, it, it, it's so... Um, go ahead. It, it's so unbelievable that I can't believe that um, so you could sit here uh, uh, lie straight out really? to, to myself and to the world. I mean, their bedroom was no more than a foot away from the bathroom. She obviously, she, she admittedly came down the stairs, asked where Christopher was. He was in the bathroom right next to her, right next to the room that she was in. She eventually came, after telling three stories about, where's Christopher? Uh, he was in the, he's in the downstairs bathroom throwing up. There was, she was standing right that. next to the downstairs bathroom I telling asked where Sally he was. that he was in the downstairs bathroom throwing up. The downstairs bathroom door was wide open. He was not in there. Then I heard Tony say, He's out, is he outside working on the car with his father? And so I said, it's snowing out. It's, what, what are you talking about? Where is he? She said, I don't know. Maybe he went for a walk. As she said that, I started getting up. Sally said, where is Christopher? And I heard Tony say, what if something really bad happened to him? I don't know. Then she told Sally, he's in the bathroom upstairs, and I was banging on the door, and he won't open it. What should I do? And Sally, Sally ran across to the house and started going up the stairs, and she called to me. She said, Bob, come up here. And uh, she screamed to me to come up here in panic, so I pushed the door as hard as I could. It flew open, and there was my son. Okay. Respond to what he's saying. Yeah, first of all, from the time I walked out of the bathroom when I had that really sick feeling something's wrong, I saw the light was on there. From the matter of the time that I saw that to the time I went down and up into their room to the time that Bob knocked that door one down was probably maybe about two minutes. I ran down the stairs, ran up into the room. I said, is Chris in here? They said, no. Bob was awake. They said, no. And I said, okay, I don't know what's going on. I thought he might be with you. I think he's in the bathroom upstairs. We need to go figure out what's going on. Sally and I ran up to the bathroom. Bob stayed in their bedroom. Sally pounded on the door, Christopher, Christopher. Then we ran, us two, ran back down up into their room. Bob said, stay here. Bob, Sally and I stayed in their bedroom. Bob ran up the stairs, pounded on the door, trying to obviously trying to break it open, and he screamed, call 911. I fell to my knees, started screaming at the top of my lungs and freaking out. And Sally said, um, and then I ran up the stairs because I wanted to see what was going on, and Bob goes, get her out of my face. I don't need her freaking out right now. And Sally keeps going, I don't know how Christopher could do this. I don't know how he could do this to his father. Why couldn't he just talk to his father? So immediately... We have to hear all this ridiculous... I, I know. It's Dr. all a lie. Dr. Phil, I have something to say. You weren't Who there. Who is this? Next, Tony's father is here and says he is outraged that Bob and Sally have the nerve to blame his daughter. Who gave Christopher his fentanyl patches, which is a highly addictive drug, and you want to blame my daughter for getting addicted to drugs? And later, I haven't really? seen you for 17 months. You didn't show up to the funeral, you didn't show up to the wake. Why, why are you I'm doing not this to me? You brought this up. No, yeah. You, because... brought, you made the accusations, that's why we're here today. I'm angry that Bob and Sally blamed my daughter for Chris's death. I believe that Bob and Sally were making a scene, concocting a drug story to pin it on my daughter so that everybody would think it was my daughter. She's on the dean's list. She does not do drugs. She lost a person that she loved very much. We're all hurting. Everyone's hurting in this. I thought Bob wanted to kill Tony. Bob is very vindictive, unpredictable, and a very dangerous man. And I believe that anybody with that frame of mind
regular basis could kill someone. We fear for our safety coming out to L.A. Okay, Rick, thank you for joining us. I'm, uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm sorry for the topic. I wish we were talking about something else. Uh, I hate to anything. believe it. But you are outraged that they are accusing her. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then when we start talking about she got him addicted to drugs when Christopher had a bad back, and then he gave Chris fentanyl patches to wear for his bad back. Is that true? No, it's not true. Did he get the fentanyl from you? No, he didn't. I'm in pain management for an injury that I, had, I received in, back in the late 90s. I've been in pain management since then. Did he get the fentanyl from you? No, he didn't. So how did he get the fentanyl? I saw him wearing patches before he died. There are tragically so many cases where kids get their parents' medication, whatever it is, and, and take it unbeknownst to their parents. I, I don't know whether you knew or didn't know. I'm just saying, did he get this from you? No, he did not get the medication from me. When you're in pain management, you get 30 days worth of prescriptions. Then you have to order it again. And you don't get any extra. There's no room for, there's no wiggle room for selling or giving or sharing this medication. Now, when I change my patch, I put it in the tin foil that it comes in, and I put it in the garbage, and I collect it in the box. It's a way of my keeping track of my medication. Never in my life did my son ever go near medication. He was a health nut. I had never, ever even thought of my son as being somebody that might um, manipulate medications of any sort. Sally just told us earlier that he was partying too much in Wisconsin because of her, and it was all over the internet, party, 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 drink and party, and all of that. So it is, it is one or the other, it can't be both. Well, drinking is different than um, drugging, in my opinion. I mean, it, it may lead to drugging, and well, it, perhaps he, it did in my son's case, but... He did son, die from an acute fentanyl overdose, right? Absolutely, he did. And he was in your house, and you take fentanyl. Yes. And he died of an overdose of that drug. Right. D now, does that not... I mean, come oh, on. Of course, that's why I'm saying the, the possibilities of him getting it from me is only if they... When they were in my room that they went through my garbage and took it out of the garbage. I would like to know and, when we were and in your room. They, which is entirely room. possible, It is correct? absolutely possible. And, no, and, 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 and those fentanyl patches can be smoked, they can be diluted, they can be all we, kinds of things after the fact, even used ones that still have the drug residue in them. Even without the drug residue. I went over this with a coroner last week, and he told me that even, even without the fentanyl, even if the patch was completely absent of fentanyl, to smoke it, is putting a poison in your body that could kill you. It's a phosgene gas or something of that nature. Right. So it's a poison either way. My son was not a per kind of person who poisoned himself. Did you give him fentanyl patches earlier for his back pain? No, and that's what makes it even more absurd. To think that, it, I mean, uh, one of her allegations is that I was giving my son fentanyl patches for two weeks before the, he came to New York. I was in New York. It wasn't, and, no, and, you uh, were, it and, wasn't the two and, weeks uh, right before. It was months before he died. And, you know, now, Chris, can I talk, now, please? If, You've had a if, long if, time to talk. If there's been any chance of him getting no. fentanyl on the street, he wouldn't have told me because they, he would, I would never have condoned that kind of behavior. And he wouldn't have told me if he did. And he was a child. He was a 19-year-old He was not kid. a child. He would never have shared that with me right, because I've got to interrupt you and take a sold. break here. And then I, I want to hear from you guys. Bob says an APB was issued for him and riot police showed up at his door the day after his son died. We're going to find out what he was being accused of when we come back. I was so scared of Bob because Bob is probably the most manipulative person I've ever met in my life. If I had to use one word to describe him, I would say Bob is evil. And later... You need to keep quiet, because I'm going to tell me? you something, young lady. Pardon me? You are lying. No, no, First of all, you don't you tell me to be quiet. Yes. I'll tell you that right I now. I don't care. I don't even know you who be you quiet. are. Whatever. I believe that Bob is very mentally unstable. When five of Chris's friends came out from Wisconsin for Chris's funeral, Bob kept calling these kids off of Chris's cell phone. I called Bob back and I told him, quit calling the kids, they're with me, they're safe. He said that he had a gun and that he was gonna come after me. And I said, Bob, is that a threat? He hung up. I did call the police and I filed a police report.
Well, Tony's dad, Rick, says Bob made threats on his life, and Tony believes Bob is behind her boyfriend, Chris's death. But Bob says he is not a murderer. The real killer is Tony. Do you believe that she killed him intentionally? I would like to ask Tony, did you wait 45 minutes to get us on purpose to make sure that he was dead? No. Okay, first of all, if you're at home with someone, if you're at a house with someone and they get up to go to the bathroom and they're gone for a little while, you do not assume they are dead. You well, do you not assume they was, are dead. You said that he was in the bathroom throwing up, so he's no, sick and he, you didn't stay with him? No, this is what happened. When we got home from dinner, I went into the downstairs bathroom to use the bathroom. When I was opening the door, Chris came in and said, I'm going to be sick. I said, okay, I'm going upstairs. I'm going to get the TV on and get in pajamas. Just come up there when you're done. So I went upstairs into the bedroom. A few minutes later, I heard, do, 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 do. I heard him go upstairs into the bathroom, okay? So I'm watching TV. I'm listening to TV. Ten minutes goes by. I pause the TV. That's when I, the windows are open. I hear a car outside. That's when I think maybe Chris was out there trying to fix it. And then about ten minutes later, I texted him. I said, where are you? He didn't respond. I called him. He didn't answer. This is when I opened the bedroom door, saw that the light was on, the bathroom was locked. But I'm not thinking, okay, he had been in there for 40 minutes. That's when I ran down and got you, and we ran back up, and you pounded on the door, Christopher. I'm not lying, so this is going to be he said, she said the whole time if this is how it's going to go. It's, I'm just it's telling really you right now, I don't know what to do. Tell the story from the beginning. You need to keep quiet. Because I'm going to tell me? you something, young lady. Pardon me? I am a mother of five children. Yeah. And I'm sitting here, and I can look at you face to face. You are lying. I, you are okay. lying. Tell the story. Tell the truth. That's exactly okay. that's no, it. That's day one, no, Sally. No, it's not. No, it's yes, not. Yes, it you is. I, there's First of all, you don't it. tell me to be yes. quiet. I'll tell you that right I now. I don't care. I don't even know you who be you quiet. are. Just chill. Whatever. <laughs> you don't tell me. <laughs> Sit out of it. Don't you are not part of this conversation. Okay. You don't matter at all. Part of the conversation is you, you need nothing. to be honest. I with am yourself. being honest. No, wow. you're not. I am nothing. No, you're not. You, hear that? you and I never okay. walked over there. Never. Yes, we did. No, we we ran up the stairs. No, you pounded on Christopher. You never came up the stairs. Yes, I did. I swear to God in my CPR, life. You do a lie detector test on me. You know I wish what? we did a lie detector I test. I don't really care. You need to face I'm a pathological liar. You're lie detector test. Yourself in the mirror. Because you know what? There's nobody else you're fooling here. Okay. This is not about anybody else. You're ridiculous. This is about telling. No. This you're is about Chris. Girl. You're Chris. right, it is. You're Who right, hated you, by the way? You have a lot to face up to. And the you're, one thing is, you guys are psychotic. You need to be in a ward. It's very sad. This is pathetic. It's so you're no, a doctor. You can no, diagnose No, people. this is this a doctor. Is so let him do something. Your well, father cannot I am, cover you. And I can. Life. Thank you. And I'm curious what you have to say about all of this. I don't think you're nothing. Mm -hmm. I think you're this girl's father, and I think that you have a vested interest here because your daughter is under attack, and I want to know what you have to say. I want to start this night from the time they went to dinner. When Chris was already sick prior to going out to dinner and told them that he was sick, and not that he went home and they all of a sudden smoked all his dope and, and died. Let's start the story from the beginning of the trip. Here, let me tell it, because I have whose car, truth. Whose car was not safe enough to even drive to college? Who I had what? to send my college. son. She goes to I college had, two miles I away from our house. $2,000 to my son to get her put new tires, new brakes, Who new struts to in do her that car. Yeah, because, because it was you unsafe. Me. Who okay, hold on. Let me, let me right. I like you. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to see anything, any oh. harm come to you. Can you say that Chris hold was on. with me all the time? That's because he loved me. Let, let and me, I didn't want to see any harm come to you. That's why I brought... Then That's why are you doing this to me? Then why are you doing, doing this anything. to me? You brought this up. No, yeah. You, brought, you made the accusations is why we're here today. I've never contacted you. I haven't really? seen you for 17 me? months. You didn't show up to the funeral. You didn't show up to the wake. Tell me what your goal is in being here with her. What is it you want to I, achieve here? I am here basically in defense. She's put me in a defensive position where she's accusing me of being a psychotic, a murderer, and things of that nature, when the fact is, I lost my son. My son is gone forever. Her life is the same. Her father's life really? is the same. Really? My life is the same? They you will, have no they idea. They didn't lose anybody. Really? I lost, I lost my son. All right, we're going to take a break, and we're going to meet one of Chris's childhood friends who says Chris had a secret that ultimately cost him his life. We'll be right back. Tony is a big, phony drama queen. She's a crazy nut that is controlling and bitchy. I did not tell Tony to come to our house and do drugs. I want Tony to wake up to the full reality of her actions. This is a serious thing.
I think Rick is a pathological liar. I absolutely believe that Rick knows exactly what happened, but it was apparent that they were making a smokescreen to block any kind of contact with them, and they were trying to make me look like a horrible person. Rick called New York State Police and made up a story that I was a dangerous sniper from the Marine Corps, and that he felt that I was coming to shoot them. This is a false police report. This is a crime. This is a felony. Well, Bob says he is convinced that Rick knows what really happened to his son and is using every tactic he can think of to cover up for his daughter. But Rick says Bob is the one who is 100% capable of murder, not Tony. Well, Chris's uh, childhood friend, Hans, says that he told him something that may be the key to unlock the mystery of what really happened that fatal night. So Hans is joining us via Polycom. Since Chris was younger, he had had uh, surgeries on his shoulder, on his knee, I, I know for a fact he had taken his father's medication before, without Bob knowing, I believe. Yeah. And basically, what I need to, people to understand is, people aren't looking at Chris. Chris could not work because of his back pain, did not have a job. He did not uh, have a place to stay other than his grandmother's house. At 20 years old, all your friends are in college. Everyone has a direction to go. He had nowhere to go. I believe Chris was depressed. I believe he was in a lot of pain. And meeting his new stepmother put a lot of stress on him. Are, are you saying that you believe that this could have been a suicide? No, I believe that Chris was using pain medication because he was depressed, because he was stressed out. Whatever happened, it was an accident. And you told Bob that Chris was stealing his pain meds? Yes. Okay. And how did Bob react? I also told him at the same, same conversation that he had been smoking marijuana, and he assumed that that would have led to tons of other drugs or things that Chris might have gotten into. Was he doing any kind of drugs, either marijuana or pain meds, before he met Tony? He was, he was smoking marijuana, and Chris was always a party animal. What, what do you all say about that? Because that kind of runs right in the face of your assessments of Tony's influence here. What we're hearing is a friend here that doesn't have a horse in the race, that's known him since seventh grade, that says he was a party animal, he was smoking dope in high school, he was stealing your pain meds. I believe Hans wholeheartedly. I believe everything that comes out of Hans' mouth. I don't think he would mislead anybody on anything. Hans told me about this, this was probably nine months after my son passed away. I was never aware that he took any of my pain medication. Is this now, inconsistent with you saying that she introduced him to this, that she, no, he became a party animal because of I, her, he was smoking marijuana because of her? Party animal is different from um, what uh, the allegation that, you know, I'm saying that she turned him into a party animal is completely different from the fact that when she brought him into the college world, and, a, and exactly. a portion of his life that I was unaware of, which became apparent to me as a parent once he got involved with Tony. Oh, we're going to take a break. Sally says Tony will end up killing someone else. Really? We're going to find out why Rick was scared to come to L.A. and face Bob for the first time since Chris's death. We'll be right back. Sally's a fake, controlling person. I could literally rip her hair out. I hate her. Look, I, I've, I, I've got to say some things here, or I'm not going to feel good about how we've spent this time here. Uh, you've heard me say a lot of things. One thing you have not heard me say is I know how you feel. Because if you haven't been through the loss that you've been through, you, you just simply can't know. So I, I don't know how you feel. And maybe that's a good thing, because maybe it's good to talk to somebody that has a different perspective or some different objectivity about it. I, I think you guys, in your pain, are demonizing Tony here and you know I wasn't there and I, I don't know what happened what I do know is that 
we have a young man here that uh, looks to me and sounds to me to have been a very fine young man and had challenges that he was facing physically and like a lot of kids that age uh, probably made some decisions and choices that were not the best. I, I know that uh, he died of acute fentanyl overdose and his dad was on fentanyl and he was in his dad's house and there was fentanyl in the house. Um, you know as well as I do that to juxtapose him to those drugs, whether he got them out of the garbage outside or wh who knows where he got them. But he got it off the street because yeah. he didn't get it out of my prescription yeah. because my prescriptions were untouched. And I, I think you would know Absolutely. if he had. And this looks to me to be very, very likely uh, an accidental overdose by a kid that got ambushed with a drug that he didn't understand the potency of. And I mean, it's, it's killing people all over the country the same way. And I, I think this was a tragic accident. And I, I hate that that is what happened, but I do think that's what happened. I, I, I certainly don't think I have seen anything. And listen, I've evaluated serial killers. I've evaluated you know, passion killers in marriages and relationships and families in every possible way. And I, I can tell you, I just, I, I don't see this murderous complex of characteristics in this young woman that would be necessary to hatch this kind of a plan. So I, I think you are brokenhearted and I think you are angry and I think you are experiencing a rage that comes with grief. And I, I think this is a target because she was not perceived by you to support your son's relationship with you. And I think that that colors the filter through which you look. And I have a critical question to ask everybody here that I think will bring some real light to this situation. I'm gonna do it right after the break. I said I had a critical question to ask everyone uh, before I do. Hans, I'm describing what I think happened here. What do you think about what I'm saying and what would you have to add to that? I agree. I think it's a really awful accident. And I think that um, both these you know, parties are overcome with grief and they were angry and they wanted, they lashed out at each other and um, it's just unfortunate because I know Chris wouldn't have want, wanted this. Well, I did not know Chris. I'm sorry that I never had the, the privilege of, of meeting him. I think he was very fortunate to have you as a friend. And I think this family is very fortunate to have you as a friend. <laughs> you know, Hans um, really got to the heart of the matter in the last comment that he made. Because the question that I have that we all have to ask is, what would Chris want right now? I know it's easier for you to see, like, that he lost his son, but Chris is my best friend. I know he would not have wanted this to happen after he died. What would Chris want, Bob? I think that he would want all, this, all these false accusations to stop. Nothing will bring my son back. This is something I had to come to grips with immediately. I, I thought about this a lot last night, that if I were in your shoes and I was taking a drug and had a drug in the house that ultimately killed my son, I would feel like maybe I'd spend a lot of the rest of my life second-guessing myself and wondering if unintentionally or some way I had contributed to his loss. I've thought about it countless times. I, I, I really, really hope that you give yourself some peace about that and celebrate all the days of his life, not the moment that he died. I hope. Mm -hmm.